Okay, thanks, Sharon. So uh, yeah, so this talk will be uh, definitely on the applications end of the spectrum. Um, and um, with that, I will just acknowledge all the collaborators um, I have at various institutions, um, notably both in industry and um, academia and uh, government. Um, and with that, I'll begin. Um, so the, uh, the vision that I'd like to uh, sell you in this talk um, and convince you is that quantum computing um, belongs in the uh, processing that um, the uh, wireless cellular network uh, does, um, which is quite extensive uh, processing demands. Um, and this slide is, is to kind of set the scene um, as to uh, what I'm talking about and what the processing uh, involves. So in the picture, you see uh, base stations. Those wireless base stations are what you see um, as you go about the, uh, you know, a normal outdoor environment. Um, and they're scattered and they are uh, connected by optical fibers or, or fast backhaul fibers um, to centralized uh, baseband processing units or BBUs. Um, and uh, via, via those uh, dark black uh, links there. And uh, what that means is that um, today, a lot of the processing that, that goes on involved in uh, receiving all the radio uh, transmissions involved in a, in a wireless cellular network happens in those uh, centralized RAN, we call them radio access network baseband units or BBUs. Um, and the thesis of this talk is that, um, is that quantum processing belongs and, and will be eventually in these um, in these uh, processing units, um, and so the uh, the arc of the research uh, and this is this is kind of um, research that's uh, medium uh, maturity. So we started this kind of line of research in 2018, um, and the the NSF project is called QE Nets for Quantum Enabled Networks, and it's um, a, a co PI arrangement with uh, Davide Venturelli. Um, who I know is active in this community. Um, and our website is, is below on this slide. It's qenets.cs.princeton.edu, uh, where you can find uh, papers that describe everything I'm talking about um, and more. So we've been at this for you know, a good, um, a good uh, three or four years uh, now. And uh, generally speaking, we're identifying bottlenecks um, to the performance of wireless networks um, that are responsible, that the processing is responsible for uh, computational processing. And we're investigating quantum computation um, in all its forms. So um, a lot of our work has focused on quantum annealing, in particular the uh, D-Wave platform, but uh, we're by no means exclusively. So we're looking at quantum classical hybrid, we're looking at quantum gate model machines, and we're also looking at uh, quantum inspired classical computation. Uh, which I won't be talking about today, but um, you're welcome to email me if you uh, are interested in learning more about that. Um, and uh, the overall kind of uh, arc of the work is to make head-to-head -head performance comparisons uh, in this application space um, between classical compute and quantum compute. Um, but what's really interesting about the problem, uh, this particular problem, you know, for this audience in particular, what's What's unique about this problem is our figures of merit, which I have here on the bottom of the slide. And, and so our figures of merit are, are unique. Um, we're looking at system cost. Um, and what we mean by that is the uh, entire cost of ownership um, of the entire uh, cellular network once one was to uh, include quantum processing units in the cellular network. Um, and I'll have more to say about that later on. Um, but we're also looking at um, our kind of application specific figures of merit. Um, and so in communications, what we're interested in as an intermediate figure of merit is this bit error rate, uh, which is the fraction of bits that are received correctly or uh, not in error when they're transmitted communicated correctly. Um, but what that leads to is the two primary figures of merit I have here on the slide, which is spectral efficiency and energy efficiency. So spectral efficiency is the number of bits per second per spectrum hertz uh, that the network is delivering to users. And that's really the, the kind of the primary um, figure of merit that uh, communication systems um, uh, deal in. And um, that's interesting because um, that is not a kind of a, an absolute, you know, did I kind of, you know, simulate my chemistry correctly or did I fold my protein correctly, um, et cetera. It's a kind of a, it, it admits a, a certain bit error rate 
um, in its uh, solving of the problem. There's a certain kind of elasticity in the solution of the problem, which we think is rather unique for this problem. And so that's something I want to really emphasize to you. Um, and then finally, energy efficiency. So, um, you know, making the uh, entire uh, um, radio access network extremely energy efficient um, in terms of the joules uh, per uh, spectral efficiency or joules per bit that is communicated um, is uh, obviously a, a key kind of uh, consideration for network designers. Um, and so uh, our work kind of focuses there and that will become clear um, towards the end of the talk today. Okay, so um, today uh, it's going to be a short talk. It's going to be like uh, 22 more minutes or so. But the first thing I want to talk to you about is really convince you of why this problem or application domain and what's really unique about it. Um, then I'm going to show you a point solution that is an example of um, point solutions in terms of realizing tasks in the um, processing of these uh, networks that um, that together they comprise all the processing that's involved. And so this one is a, um, a low density parity check decoder that was implemented on a, on a quantum annealer. Uh, that's my uh, student Shrikar's work uh, that was presented a couple of years ago at the Mobicom conference. Um, and then I'm gonna zoom out finally and get that big picture and do an energy performance um, analysis in the time I have left. So uh, why this problem? So um, in NextG wireless cellular networks, this is just a, uh, a, uh, a slide that is listing all the performance goals, the uh, rather um, uh, stretch um, ambitious performance goals that uh, NextG cellular networks involved. We're trying to scale up the capacity and the spectral efficiency of the networks. Um, we are trying to uh, serve many thousands of nodes very quickly, uh, scaling up their capacity. But what that means is um, wireless technologies abound. And at the end, the processing required to implement all these wireless technologies gets bigger and bigger. Um, and then the, um, the second thing about this processing in a cellular network is that um, the way that cellular networks have structured their processing processing so far is to actually reduce the processing demands to the minimal required. And the consequence of doing that is that they've left um, wireless network performance on the table. So I have two examples. The first one is um, multi-user massive MIMO detection. So basically the idea here is that your mobile users down here are trying to transmit uh, signals to the um, base station. Um, they have many antennas together and the base station has many antennas. Uh, hence, collectively, it's a multi-input, multi-output uh, system or a MIMO system. And they're all transmitting on the same frequencies at the same time. And so uh, the cellular network is trying to uh, unentangle uh, their transmissions from each other. And the, um, the typical way, the kind of the status quo that this is done is a very low complexity uh, linear filter um, called the minimum mean squad error receiver or MMSE receiver. And um, the observation that we make is that suppose the base station has 176 antennas. Um, as the number of users gets up to 176, um, the problem gets harder and harder, as you might expect. Um, but the, the, the kind of the status quo ways kind of start to fall down in terms of packet success rate, which you can think of as a, as a proxy for spectral efficiency. Um, when the users start to even approach 80 out of the 176 based in station antennas. And so what this means is there's plenty of room for uh, throughput gains um, in terms of supporting more and more users, which would uh, translate into higher and higher spectral efficiency. In fact, this big yellow region here is the, uh, the throughput gains that are possible um, if you go to the maximum likelihood performance um, which may well be possible um, with uh, some of the quantum computation techniques that, um, that are uh, on the table here. Second example is um, what I'll go into into more depth, but this is a, a low density power check code uh, decoder. So the typical way we decode low, de low density power check codes 
um, is we use this uh, belief propagation decoder and belief propagation um, yeah, operates in terms of iterations where they're uh, propagating information between uh, bits and uh, the constraints of the code itself to try and correct bit errors. Um, but <clears throat> excuse me, what you need to know is the more iterations that um, the belief propagation error uh, decoder is taking. Um, first of all, the better the performance, we're looking at block error right here, so lower is better. Um, but second, uh, the more iterations, the more computation. And so typically what you see here in this black curve is that typical designs, they only use eight or 10 iterations because they have to get the job done uh, in a finite amount of time. And um, they thus sacrifice bit error rate uh, and block error rate and hence spectral efficiency. Um, again, same story. If we were to um, you know, take the iterations out to 100 or even beyond 100 to the maximum likelihood or best possible performance, um, then we could drive the block error rate down with a consequent increase in spectral efficiency. And the gap is pretty large here, um, as you see. Okay, so those two examples are to kind of um, give you the takeaway message that um, the status quo is leaving performance on the table. And were we to have more computation to throw at these problems, we would be able to increase spectral efficiency um, and make these networks faster and do something that really matters to wireless networks. So um, that is the networking perspective. When I talk to people who design um, networks, I'm trying to convince them of why is quantum compute um, kind of useful for wireless, and that's the point I just made. There's an elasticity in the relationship between spectral efficiency versus the amount of compute that you throw at the problem. And so in both of these examples, if we throw more compute, uh, we can do better. Um, for this audience, um, who are uh, working on uh, uh, quantum devices and quantum computation um, itself, um, the kind of salient question is why uh, are wireless applications kind of a unique and interesting application? So let me spend most of my time here on the right-hand side of the slide. So why, are wire why is wireless a really unique application? Um, and the first kind of property of wireless is that it's got to operate at line rate. So line rate means like communication line rate, um, where uh, blocks are kind of flying by at the millisecond uh, granularity. And what that means is you don't have like hours or days or even minutes uh, to solve any given problem um, on, on, a, on a quantum machine, you have, uh, you know, single digits to tens to maybe, you know, 50 to 100 uh, at most milliseconds in order to uh, solve that problem. And so um, there's a low computational latency uh, required, not too low, but uh, lower than other problems. So there's a, a kind of, kind of a, a, a demand um, from wireless uh, that's that's unique in that way. High computational throughput as well. Um, and so the you know the combination of low com computational latency and high computational throughput um, gives rise to many interesting kind of design questions in computer architecture about how we design and integrate um, the uh, quantum processing with classical processing and uh, the rest of the supporting kind of structure that, that goes around the uh, qubits um, with uh, such an application. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The third um, and uh, other kind of salient points um, from uh, your perspective about why, why wireless is interesting is something I alluded to earlier um, in that this is an approximate computation. So there's no, you know, there is a correct answer and the correct answer is the bits that were transmitted by the transmitter. Um, but because we, uh, as well as the network designers, we throw um, error correction codes at um, the problem and we give ourselves this kind of uh, error tolerance. Um, oftentimes, a lot of the computation tasks are um, approximate and they tolerate a certain bit error rate in their output. And that's interesting because um, then, um, you know, just kind of looking ahead, the, uh, you know, the approximate methods, maybe optimization methods, maybe annealing methods like, um, like Andrew King was talking about earlier, um, might become particularly interesting um, or, you know, a finite number of shots in a gate model might all become particularly interesting because we can tolerate a bit error rate and we can do things kind of probabilistically and we know the 
power of, of approximate algorithms and probabilistic computation. And there's a lot of kind of space in that design space. And so wireless networks kind of play into that because they tolerate the uh, bit error rate. Okay, so here is a, uh, a kind of a chronology and I, my, my time is short, so I'm not gonna spend too much time, but this is to kind of uh, show you the journey that uh, I've been on and, and, and my group's been on and, and collaborators and, um, and uh, kind of convince you that, you know, we've been looking at this problem um, first in massively parallel uh, traditional silicon architectures back from, you know, 2017 and even before that 2015, we have SIGCOM papers. If you go to my lab's website, you can, um, you can fetch those uh, papers. But this kind of started when I was at University College London before coming to Princeton um, with uh, some collaborators in, in the UK. Um, more recently, uh, we looked at uh, a slew of kind of point problems on the uplink, um, as I mentioned, when users are transmitting to the cell tower and on the downlink as well. Um, a line of work on error control codes uh, then start started separately. Um, that led to quantum-inspired work that's more recent, um, and we're looking at gate model QAOA um, other quantum inspired machines. Uh, and then finally out here on the right hand side, we have uh, kind of the big picture work that I'll say a few words about. Okay, so here is a segue now to a kind of a point solution more on that low density parity check decoder. So so here's a kind of a cartoon of a low density parity check uh, decoder. You see it has uh, check bits here on the uh, check nodes here on the upper and uh, the information bits. And it basically passes information up and down between those bits. And uh, I told you before about that compromise. And so what we've done here is we've actually implemented the uh, low density parity check decoder on the D-Wave machine. And we have a way, this is uh, Srikar Kasi's work, one of my students, um, he came up with a way of uh, encoding this uh, low density parity check uh, decoder, that graph you saw on the previous slide. He came up with a way of um, reducing that graph and the belief propagation iterations that occur on that graph into a Cubo problem um, where the uh, Cubo is comprised of uh, two terms in a, in a function that gets minimized by the D wave. Um, quantum annealer, or indeed any uh, quantum annealing optimization device. Um, and the function has two terms, as I say. Um, the first term is um, taking all the received bits. So the, um, the receiver is where the LDPC decoder operates. There's a transmitter at some remote location. The receiver is the LDPC decoder. And um, the receiver takes the uh, received data bits and it wants to ensure um, the, this first term wants to ensure that the received data bits uh, correspond to one of several valid LDPC code words. So the way that LDPC corrects errors is basically if you have um, n received uh, data bits, only k of those, um, uh, only some fraction rather of those data bits um, possibilities are going to be valid code words. And then you know that if you receive an invalid code word that um, you, need, you know that it, it can be corrected. And so uh, Srikar's function assigns a higher energy band to those <clears throat> invalid code words and a zero energy band to those valid code words. And then and the second term in his, um, in his Cuba reduction is this distance function. And what that does is it's looking at all of the um, code words and it's comparing the distance of the received bits to the, um, each of the code words and what that means is that the correct code word is going to be minimum distance. And that's actually, you can, you can show that that's the maximum likelihood or, or optimal decoder is that minimizes the distance between the received bits and um, a decoded code word. And that is the correct uh, code word. And so together, the uh, satisfier function and the distance function, they uh, where they work together to select a valid code word and then select the correct code word. And when you optimize the resulting Cubo, um, you get a, a, a low density parity check decoder itself. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, Srikar made a very efficient embedding 
on the um, on the D Wave machine, and uh, this we're looking at now is a uh, I believe it's a Chimera uh, topology. It's the older topology, um, but you know similar embeddings are possible on the on the newer uh, on other topologies as well. Um, and I, I think the nice thing that uh, Shikar did here is that he has a two level embedding, and so in one of the Chimera uh, units cells, he's using one of those unit cells to, um, to represent one of the LDPC um, parity checks, and that happens by kind of embedding onto one of the unit cells, as you see here. But you notice that it also leaves um, qubits that are unused, um, which he goes back and he reuses those qubits in a level two embedding that's going to then use multiple um, unit cells, so a three by three array of unit cells, in order to uh, embed another um, LEPC parity check onto that group of unit cells. So there's a kind of an overlay scheme here where uh, individual parity checks are, embe are embedded onto individual unit cells and a big, um, a big uh, group of unit cells uh, implement another parity check. So the upshot is that this is a really, really efficient embedding because we're using all of the uh, qubits that are existing on the machine, um, extremely efficiency. Actually, it's 100% efficient. Okay, so here's some performance results. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail, but um, we have a performance advantage. So if you look at uh, the best possible belief propagation uh, decoder, that would be the red uh, curve here, even up to 100 iterations, which is actually being extremely charitable to the um, to the uh, belief propagation and uh, Shrikar scheme, the quantum belief propagation uh, scheme is achieving a lower bit error rate or better performance at these uh, slightly higher signal to noise ratios. Um, signal to noise ratio means the about the amount of, of uh, noise that is on the wireless channel and uh, cellular networks often operate within uh, these areas of say you know, three to 10 decibels of um, of SNR uh, noise. This is a kind of a practical operation point, a realistic operation point. All right, uh, segueing now to the big picture work. Um, so that was a point solution, um, but uh, another kind of strand of our work um, was looking at uh, next G cellular wireless networks as a whole system and asking, you know, when is quantum compute going to get really useful for these types of um, systems? And, um, and in particular, um, looking at uh, the increasing power consumption um, that these systems are demanding. So it turns out that running these base stations um, accounts for most of the uh, operational expenditure of a, uh, a cellular provider, um, not to mention the associated uh, environmental emissions with that much electricity that's being um, used. And so the, what providers typically do is they want to um, you know, basically put most of their network to sleep. That's fundamentally, that's kind of the most effective thing to do is to turn off base stations during idle and low traffic times and kind of sparsify your network when there aren't many users um, using it. Um, but also, you know, the uh, providers are also going to be optimizing their hardware components. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at um, a comparison between um, CMOS, uh, silicon hardware, um, and we're looking at how this is going to kind of converge with quantum compute um, over the years. And in particular, we're looking at, you know, you know, in by the end of the decade, um, CMOS is scaling down now to eight nanometer, 10 nanometer, eight nanometer, but it looks to um, plateau at 1.5 nanometer um, by the end of uh, the decade. And so what's this going to mean? Uh, so first of all, we're taking that like kind of um, asymptotic uh, CMOS performance as our, as our kind of baseline for the Bake Off. Um, and we're looking at what that means for how we believe quantum compute will evolve um, to compete with CMOS. And so the takeaways um, are, are, are here. So 
uh, first question that we asked was how many how many uh, qubits are we going to need for 5G? So 5G networks, as you're probably aware, are the uh, current um, state of the art in wireless networks, and they're being rolled out right now. And um, the answer is pretty like um, you know we we feel pretty uh, optimistic actually. So you know for a small base station um, to actually realize 5G processing, we need about 40,000 qubits for a, a larger base station that goes up to three million. Um, but then, uh, you know, how much power or cost uh, can quantum save over uh, CMOS? At this point, uh, for a small base station, there's no be uh, no benefit. Um, but for a larger base station, 45% um, benefit. And then uh, we're predicting, you know, a couple of years for feasibility. Um, and then for a larger base station, uh, you know, a decade uh, plus. So um, what we're doing in the paper and... Uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into the details, but um, the uh, the figures of merit that we're looking at are spectral efficiency and energy efficiency. And then uh, the methodology is what we're doing is something we think is actually completely fair. So we're taking uh, CMOS and QA and we're saying that if the two are going to be delivering equal spectral efficiency, so they're going to be delivering equal bits per second per spectrum um, to all their users, you know, how many qubits is that going to require for QA? And what's the energy comparison between CMOS and QA? So we want to take them uh, delivering kind of equal apples to apples, delivering equal performance, and then evaluate spectral efficiency and energy efficiency on that equal um, performance. So let me, um, let me fast forward a little bit uh, through the... Um, through the, uh, the details, but um, what we did uh, to kind of summarize was we, um, we took the state of the art that we know of for all of the quantum annealing uh, platforms that we're publicly aware of. So um, we are aware of uh, work at Lincoln Labs, work in the, uh, I believe it's the QEO pro uh, program in ARPA and the D-Wave work. And we uh, took that uh, all those designs and we said, you know, what is the fastest that uh, these designs are going to be able to uh, to do in terms of readout and um, and everything? And then we um, projected forward in terms of uh, we projected forward the qubit requirements um, that uh, a fastest such design uh, would be uh, would be required. Uh, here is a function of um, bandwidth uh, uh, in megahertz of the uh, of the network, and so uh, this is one base station. And here you see that uh, qubit requirements are going uh, just topping a million and uh, projecting forward as to when we believe that might be feasible based on kind of linear extrapolation trends in the past, uh, very similar to the graphs that um, Andrew showed you before. Uh, these are our year projections. And um, finally, I'm going to skip over a, a number of slides, but um, we looked at, uh, so here's the qubit count, and here's, uh, here's the actual qubit count, and these are, these are actually D-Wave uh, uh, examples, um, but uh, linear projection, uh, we're projecting by the end of, say, 2026, QA is solving uh, quantum annealing is solving uh, practical uh, systems holistically. Um, and then when will it have a power advantage or an energy advantage over CMOS? We're looking at uh, between 2035 and 2040 um, that we gain that power advantage with uh, just shy of 10 million qubits. Okay, so uh, that's the end. Uh, so summarizing, um, I showed you this uh, kind of point solution for low density parity check codes and uh, kind of talked in the abstract about this um, big uh, holistic energy performance uh, analysis. So that was presented at uh, ACM ISCA conference and the, the quantum resource estimation workshop. You can find that on um, archive. Um, all of the papers you can find on my group's website. That's uh, pause.princeton.edu. Um, and I'll just close by uh, saying thanks to the organizers for fitting me in. Um, and we're looking at new hardware uh, and uh, even, even more problems. Uh, and with that, I'll take some questions.